from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15. I've loved you the way my Father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done. Kept my Father's commands and made myself at home in his love. I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy, and your joy wholly mature. This is my command, love one another the way I have loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on, your li on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do these things that I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. I've made you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. You didn't choose me, remember. I chose you and put you into the world to bear fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, you ask the Father in relation to me, and he gives you. But remember the root command, love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Praise to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Peter had a problem. In the book of Acts, it's documented. They wanted to command Jesus Christ to their fellow Jews. But their fellow Jews brought their friends. And when they brought their friends, they didn't quite think like the Jews. They had their own traditions. They had their own religions. They had their own grounding. Some of them spoke different languages. They came from other lineages. Some of them just carried themselves differently. Some had different colored skin. Some just culturally didn't know what was going on with them. And suddenly they had a decision to make. They're in a gathering like this. These people are surrounded. They've requested baptism. And Peter's out in the middle of this trying to moderate. And it's one of the most explosive questions that you could ever imagine, but sometimes it goes underneath the radar. Peter says to the crowd, anybody got a problem with me baptizing them? Like giving, you know, I often wonder, you know, what would happen? And in a sense, everyone sort of has a little hand that's ready to go up because they'd say the obvious, you know, it's really obvious, it's the elephant in the room, Peter. There is a serious problem with not baptizing, with baptizing them. They're not one of us. They're not in my tribe. People are tribal. People had to be tribal. You dial back on this planet tens of thousands of years, and you realize for people to survive, they had to pull together in their families, in their extended families, in order to survive in order to survive the cold, in order to have food, in order to prevail, in order not to get clobbered by the neighbors or marauders or other people, you had to have your tribe. And so tribes emerged, and those eventually grow into nation states where you have boundaries around the land where those tribes gather and they define their identity. And from the beginning of time, people just, they want to defend their tribe, it's natural. And they want to meet the needs of their families. And there are little points of collision in this world and in the flow of history that are so critical. And the flow that is challenged in this story is when Peter said, anybody got a problem with them receiving our most sacred welcome now into the life of Jesus? And nobody said a word. And they baptized them that day, and they all cheered, and they knew the face of Christianity had been changed forever. Some people would still like to make it tribal. You know, just my clan, just my nationality, just my nation state, just my country, just the color of my skin. And every time we try to do that, and we get back to these texts, we are reminded there are... There's only one tribe when it comes to Jesus Christ. 
There's only one tribe. We can try to break it off into many. We break it off into nominations. We break it off into our you know, own styles and ways of doing church. But there's only one great tribe. And we've been invited into it. And we get to bring our friends, whoever they may be. It's a beautiful thing. In the Gospel of John, talking about that cohesion, and this is about that cohesion of our new tribe, our greater tribe. He says, I've loved you the way my fathers loved, loved you. And he says, one love is the way that I've loved one, Loving one another is the way I've loved you. And he said, this is the very best way. When you love one another most deeply and most committed, you are willing to put your life down for your friends. You are willing to lay down your life. So then I start thinking, well, what's the character of love? Oftentimes we see, you know, let's add Jesus to my life, feel a little more affectionate towards people, smile a little more, shake hands a little more, and be more polite. And sometimes we reduce Christianity, just be more polite and cheerful in life, and everything's fine. And then he says, love people the way I love you. How did Jesus love you? What was he willing to give for that love? What was he willing to sacrifice? What was he willing to give over? And you realize there's a fierce love. There's a deeply committed love. There's a mother's love, a parent's love. There's the kind of love that said, if you are put at risk, I will stand between it. And we do that for our families because it's just naturally, it's poured into us most of the time. But Jesus expands it and says, people, this is your family. And that is your family. And it's as far as you can see, and it's as far as you can imagine. That now is your new family. Love them as I've loved you. They become your friends. And then you have this new way of seeing home. And when I think of home and parenting and nurturing and mothers, and I think, one of the things we often say is, you know, the mother is queen of the nest, you know, and makes it warm and caring, and the caregivers, the, the, the people that care for the children and look after them, and we have our own little nests that are squirreled away, and you realize we need those. We often need a den to go into, and a supper table, and that place where we work out our issues, and we grow our children, and we teach them. But what does it mean that Jesus said, make your home in my love? Don't just make your home in that place. We need that place. Please, do it well. It's a, it's a call from God. But make your home in my love. And if you make your home in love, it's not just bringing love into your home, but make your home in that love, then you're always at home. If you make your home in that love, you can pull up stakes like mission builders and go live on the fly in two congregations a year, building in the north in the summer and in the south in the winter, and you're still home. Every step of the way, you're home. You see what I mean? If people learn to make their home and settle into the love of God deeply and connected and understand that that's my resting place, that's my guiding place, that's the place that gives me and everyone around me value, that's the place where I'm grounded and cared for and nurtured, then you are never not at home. Christians are people who can be called anywhere, anywhere on this planet to do anything that is needed, and you are still deeply at home. Have you known personalities like that? And I still love coming back to my den, you know. I love getting my space. I got my chair, you know. But I also know that that's just my own little perch. And that my deepest sense of home is beyond me. And when I live into that, I can go anywhere in this world, talk to anyone, and know that I am talking to my tribe and my people. And my sense of home has become so rich in that. So rich. Sometimes we've gotten a little isolated. I was talking to Pastor Jim Kim, and he's pastor of Church for All People in, uh, I think it's Cottage Grove is where it is, just near the center of Minneapolis, first ring. 
And he's got a congregation that is about half the size of ours, and there are 26 nations represented in it. 26 different countries. And that's people that were born in those nations. You know, not just claiming it as heritage. And we claim it as heritage, and that's still our nation in a way. And I said, well, who has the most trouble living into that great mix of nations? And he said, well, that's very easy. It's just the white people. <laughs> and I'm going, hey, what do you mean, you know? That's how, how come, we know what community is, we like it. He said, no, he said, you got it, it's nothing personal. He said, it's just that those who are most affluent in society, typically, are also the most privatized. You can live in gated communities, you can live in homes with lots of elbow room, you can live in homes we isolate, we got good sound protection in our homes. We got Bose headphones, you know? We got things that can separate us out from the world. He said, it's really more of a challenge getting white people to stretch out beyond their isolation and their privatization. And I thought, oh, okay, he's extending a hand. And then I realized he wasn't just dissing me. He was just extending a hand and saying, if you want to feel and know the richness of the full measure of the kingdom of God in community, you probably have to look to some other cultures for how they look and act and serve. And when we used to go down to Mexico, uh, out of Colorado, to build homes in an APRA and on a dump setting, and we'd go down around among the world's poorest people, what was most striking about it to us, and some of you have experienced that too, is how happy they were, how interconnected they were, how they lived together. And I was jealous of their sense of community because they had no home, but they were deeply at home. From my perspective, they didn't even have a shed and they were deeply at home in life. People, make your home in the love of God, and you are always at home. Lord God, we've made our homes in so many places in life, following our appetites, following ideas, following our notions of the good life, and often it is bankrupt, often we have not found the deep connections with people that we need. And we are deeply lonely. Help us to find our home in your love. To learn that in our families, to teach that at our dinner tables, to find it so deeply that we know the power of your grace and life and love and joy into this world, no matter where you call us, no matter what you choose us to do. Give us the strength to live with courage. Give us the strength to find that boldness, to live into the future of your own design and see our deepest home in your holy.